Happy Sabbath, church! Our opening hymn this morning is hymn number 152, Tell Me the Story of Jesus. Living presents Taste and See. The story for today, Answered Prayer. My name is Martine Charles. I had been in banking for almost 18 years and the stress and pressure of the industry began to wear on me. I asked God to provide me with a new career that helped me to respond to my financial responsibilities, the time to spend with my family, a new purpose, and also to begin returning a faithful tithe and offering. I have to admit, when I started tithing and offering, it actually got harder for me financially. I felt like I couldn't afford it, but I continued. I was determined to see the promises of Malachi 310 come to fruition in my life. During this time, my best friend of 20 years lost her husband to suicide, and a week before her husband died, she had lost her job. It was a very difficult time for her. I tried to help her financially, spiritually, in any way that I could. That's why I'm contemplating going back to a corporate job. Yeah, I understand. I really don't want you to go back. To corporate America, especially, 
knowing everything that you've gone through with your children, and I know that this is important for you to be there. I'm at this time. Well, what can I do then? Why don't you start a transportation brokerage company? I know that you've been helping his, your friend out in his trucking business over the last several months, and you've learned a lot. So I've been thinking about the idea that you gave to me. Mm -hmm. I already have a lot of connections in the industry. Yeah. The potential for profit is really, really great. But I'd like for you to do it with me. Oh, yes. I'll do it Will with you? you. Yes, I'll do it with you. I am normally pretty conservative about business ventures. To my surprise, I immediately agree. We started our transportation logistics company delivering goods all over the metro Atlanta area and made the decision to dedicate our business to the Lord. We declared that this was his business and we were his humble servants. On our website, there is a red banner on the top that represents the blood of Jesus and a constant reminder that this business is for him. In August of 2017, we started our first contract and in one week, we made back our initial investment. We've never had to put money back into the business and it's been profitable since its start. God has blessed me beyond all that I could ask or imagine through this business. Not only was I able to leave the stress of banking behind, I had more time to spend with my family. In addition, I was in a better financial position than I had been in previously. I want to invite you to be faithful to God. He is always faithful to us. What he says he will do, he does. Oh, taste and see. Good morning, boys and girls, and happy Sabbath. Today's children's story, we're going to talk about prayer. Here with me, I have a phone. The main purpose of this phone is so that we can communicate and call someone. Who are some people you wish you could call? Anyone far away? Can you just call any number to reach my cell phone? No, you must know what my phone number is. Did you know God wants us to call him? He even gave us his number. God's number is J-E-S-U-S, -S, Jesus. Just like you can't call any number to call me, we can't just call any number to reach God. Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus goes on to say in John 14, verse 13 through 14, Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. He says in Jeremiah 29, verse 12, Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. God invites us to call him anywhere, anytime. He's always available. Talking to someone on the phone involves more than us just talking into the phone. It involves us listening and prayer does too. We need to be quiet and realize God wants to speak to us, but we must listen. There are five tips we can do to help us remember what we can talk to God about in prayer. Our thumb giving thanks. Look around and always remember to thank God and give, him, and give him a big thumbs up. Even give thanks for the hard things knowing that God can work them out for your good. Number two, your pointy finger. Praise. On the pointing finger to, rem on the, on the pointing finger to remember to praise God for who he is and what he's done and point others to him. Three, the middle finger, the tallest one, is leaders. Pray for those who lead, teach, and help us. This may include your parents and grandparents, as well as your teachers and church members. Your ring finger, which is the weakest finger, you would write weak. Because it is the weakest finger, it will remind you to pray for the sick, hurting, or poor, as well as your younger siblings or friends. Five, me. Yes, God wants to hear about you. Share your needs, your fears, your excitements, your wants, and ask him to lead and guide you. Starting today, let us use these five tips to help us remember what we can talk to God about in our prayer. Happy Sabbath! This world of ours, the frantic pace of changing hearts, where no one plays familiar roles, but in these days one promise holds. I can ride the morning winds and do
Sabbath, everyone. Today's scripture reading is found in Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 22. It reads, Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on the left, in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, We are able. Good morning, everyone. I'm glad that you can join us again this morning for our worships, our worship hour. This morning we are doing something very unique. It's never been done here at our church to the best of my knowledge. We are doing a live streaming of the sermon. Right now, as I'm speaking to you, it is 11.14 Eastern Time. And the only audience I have here is Joel Cho, Jason Wilhelm, and Sebastian Latour is there as my audience today. And you, of course, are joining live stream through the video live streaming. So this is very new, a very new experience. This is the fourth time in front of the camera. I'm not sure I'm getting any more uh, comfortable with this uh, situation, but it's a new experience, and I'm thankful for this uh, new experience. I also want to remind our church family, next week we are going to meet at our church. We will meet at our church to have a corporate worship. And I want to uh, let you know that Jason Wilhelm will be sending email to all of our church members uh, uh, delineating detailed instructions how we will conduct, conduct a church meeting here at our church. So please look out for this email, and once you receive that, read it very carefully. There are some specific instructions, so if you will read it carefully and follow the instructions, it will make our first of uh, this uh, very unprecedented church gathering uh, go smoothly as possible. So I want you to uh, look forward to that and look forward to the email uh, that will be sent out this week. And again, this is a very new experience, and uh, we welcome all of you who are able to um, uh, join this uh, live streaming uh, worship service. Oh, I really appreciate the special music, especially that was very uh, unique. Um, so thank you for that very much, and all the, uh, scripture reading and, and children's story. Thank you for participating in this uh, worship service. Uh, I, I want to take this moment to uh, express my sorrow or sadness. You know, there was a man that I deeply owe, uh, as an adult, a closer walk with God for the past 24 years. He's had a, a major impact in my life. I have read many of his books. I have heard many of his CDs. I have gone to his conventions. He has taught me. He has made Christianity more relevant in today's climate of uh, in reality, bring the gospel more to uh, relevance for me in this day and age. He had a very unique ability to bring theology, philosophy, poetry, and gospel uh, together in a very unique way that made it very relevant in today's society. To me, he was like the modern apostle Paul. I still have many of his CDs, and his message will be televised still of the radio, but I will really miss uh, his voice. Even though I have never met him as, in a, as a person, 
but I feel like I know him well. And uh, his name is Ravi Zacharias. He died in May 19, 2020 from a very uh, brief battle with cancer. And from what I understand, to his very last breath, uh, he was just overwhelmed with gratitude towards the people who are involved in his ministry, his family, and to those around, and continually in, uh, encouraging uh, people in Christ. And so uh, it's a, we've, we've, we've lost a giant. We've lost a modern-day apostle, uh, Apostle Paul. So he, I, had, I had to express uh, my uh, sadness uh, of his passing. Let us uh, uh, go into the today's message, and before we begin, let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I can only share what the Spirit has revealed to me and the impact and the insights that Holy Spirit has revealed into my heart to make gospel even more meaningful that has brought me to closer appreciation for the plan of salvation and for the character, character of God and His kingdom and I thank you, and as I share, attempt to share this this morning, Father, we know that the Holy Spirit is always accompanying us as we meditate and contemplate upon heavenly things. As always, Lord, I commit this hour to you and be with all the listeners that we may be united in the Holy Spirit. Open our ears, our eyes, and our heart that we may be receptive. I pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's very uh, warm and, uh, in this uh, podium, so again, please excuse me as I take my jacket off. As a scripture reading, um, you know, well, before we go into that, um, I'm going to talk about something that is so mundane and so common that it seems silly to talk about. This morning, I'm probably most of you have uh, used a cup in one or, one or the other capacity. I drank my uh, a barley with milk in a cup. I had a small bowl of um, granola cereal this morning in a cup. So I imagine that you have used a cup this morning, and we will continue to use the cup throughout the day to drink of, of some sort of beverage. And so today, from uh, today's message is drinking of the cup. As a scripture reading, I'm not going to read it, but let me give you the background of our scripture reading. So here Jesus is with his disciples. And the mother of the sons of Zebedee, she brings James and John through all the disciples in front of Jesus. And she kneels before Jesus and she makes a request to Jesus and says, Jesus, please make my son James and John sit at the right and left side of in your kingdom. And when, he is, when, when mother has asked this request, Jesus does not scold her. Jesus looks at her and says, what is it that you want? And she, this is the request that she made. And Jesus responds by saying, do you know what you are asking? Are you able to, are you able to drink of the cup that I'm about to drink? Are you, are you able to be baptized in that baptism that I was baptized in? And Jesus and, the, and the James and John, they respond to Jesus and says, we are able. And so then Jesus says to them, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. So here we see, and you know, and the, the story goes that disciples hearing all this became very angry with uh, these two brothers and the mother because they were all jealous. And they all wanted to be sitting in the right and left hand in the kingdom of God. And so what is this cup that Jesus is saying to the mother of the sons of Zebedee and to James and John? Are you able to drink of this cup? And so to talk, about, to, to talk about this call, we need to go to Matthew 26. Matthew 26, and we are coming to the verse 36 to uh, 46. And here, this is right after the Lord's Supper, and this is after Jesus predicts the Peter's denial. Jesus, once again, uh, J Peter, James, and John, J Jesus calls Peter, James, and John again, to the Gethsemane and invites them to pray with him while he is praying. And so uh, please follow with me if you are able to. Matthew chapter 26, 36. Then Jesus came with them to a place 
called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here with me and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his uh, face and prayed, saying, This is important, uh, Jesus' prayer to the Father. O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them asleep and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, the second time he went away and prayed, saying, O Father, my Father, if this cup cannot pass from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and found them again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same word. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hand of the sinner. So from this scripture and the Gethsemane, here I want to just briefly view it's very important. And here are three times Jesus goes away, leaves Peter, James, and John, goes away three times to the, to separately to pray. And three times, Jesus, what's, what's the prayer that Jesus prays? He says, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So Jesus prays his prayer, and, he, and then he goes back to see his, to get comfort from the disciples if they're praying. And then he comes back second time, he prays the same prayer. And after all, he goes back to his disciples to see if they are praying. And then he comes back again, he prays the same prayer third time. If Jesus is praying this prayer for a third time, do you think it's important? Now, as I was reading this, this is a very familiar text for us Christians, and I wanted to ask a question, what does it mean for Jesus? Must I drink this cup? Must I drink this? Let this cup pass. What is this cup that Jesus is talking about? And in order to go further with this, I want to tell you what, how I interpret Jesus' prayer to the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane. And that is this. When Jesus asks, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. I, f- I think that what Jesus is asking is, Father, is there any other way? It's in our the kind of language there, we can more readily understand. Jesus is saying, Father, is there any other way? Now, is Jesus really afraid? Is this the cup that uh, we all know, but this is not the cup that Jesus is afraid of the physical and emotional suffering that he is about to go with the crucifixion. But we all know well from the Revelation 14, 10 and many other scriptures that this is the wrath of God that is uh, the wrath of God that is eternal separation from God. It is God's righteous judgment against the sinful humanity. Uh, we'll visit there briefly in uh, Revelation chapter 14, uh, 14, 10. This is right after the uh, three angels' message. Uh, I'll start with nine, uh, verse 9. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worship the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So the the wrath of the cup that Jesus is asking the Father, Father, must I drink this cup? Or another way to paraphrase it, Father, is there any other way? Is there any other way? I like what, how this is described, the, the, this, this, uh, the struggle that Jesus had in Gethsemane. I like how it's described in the Desire of Ages, page 753. And read, uh, please listen carefully. 
Satan, with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave as a conqueror or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath wrath upon him as a man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. With amazement, angels witnessed the Savior's despairing agony. The host of heaven veiled their faces from this fearful sight. So here, when Jesus is asking the Father, Father, if it is it possible they can take this cup away from me? Jesus, in essence, is asking the Father three times, Father, is there any other way? Is there any other way? Is there any other way? The answer from the heaven above, answer from the Father, heaven above, silent from the heaven above, the answer from the, was, there is no other way. Silence from the heaven, from the Father's throne, was that there is no other way. You know, oftentimes when I go to different churches, and even in our podium, the speaker will get up and say, we, we have a chant, God is good. And the audience will come back and say, good all the time. And then the speaker will say, God is good all t- God is, okay, I'm getting confused. So, all the time, and then the audience will respond back, God is good. You know, um, There are three parts that I want to discuss. I, I went a little bit ahead of myself. First, I want to examine about the Father, what this says about the Father. Now, the second part is I want to see how this, this dialogue, this, uh, this scenario that we are visualizing in Matthew 26, how this affects God's father and son's relationship, and lastly, how it affects what it means to us. And so the first, we go, to, so, okay, coming back, we say that God is good all the time. You know, this is a little bit off the tangent, but we Christians look at, we, we say we are good, but when we see something that is evil uh, outside, something that is occult or uh, something that is removed from our church, we say that is evil. From a Christian perspective, there is a distinction that is very clear. But when Adam and Eve ate the, free, the forbidden fruit of tree of knowledge of good and evil, Satan promised them that they would be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil. And this is a time for a different topic. But at that moment, Satan introduced a whole new philosophy teaching of the yin-yang. And so, you know, the occult world, they say themselves, yes, Christians, they may be good and they may call us evil, but we are the opposite halves of God. So into them, God is opposite, positive, negative, black and white, light, darkness. God is simply a yin-yang, and to them, they are a worship, they are a part of that same God. But my friend, let me ask you this. If God were to excuse, can God excuse a sin and still be called good? I guess it's a matter of debate, but I think God can still be called good. But, for, but what we need to realize, not only is God good, God is holy. So if God is holy, then there is no compromise with sin. First Peter 1.16, it says, Because it is, it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And so when I see the silence from the heaven, and the silence from the heaven is answered from the Father from the, from through the silence of heaven is that there is no other way. What, what that tells me is that God is all-powerful God, and He does not share His throne with sin. He does not compromise with sin. 
And so what God is saying to his son, when he says, Father, is there any other way? Father is saying, son, I do not compromise with sin. There is no other way. In order for you to conquer sin, you must go through this. Second, how does that describe the relation between the father and the son? You know, when Jesus is asking the Father, Father, is there any other way? What Jesus is asking, is Je- when, I'm sorry, when Jesus asks the Father, if it be possible, take this cup away from me, or if Jesus is asking, Father, is there any other way? Jesus is asking the questions of all humanity throughout ages. Jesus is asking, must a son, must, a, must I be sacrificed in order for humanity to have salvation? Does the sin require a, a penalty of death? Is my blood shed, is it really necessary? So is there any other way? Isn't this the question that many of us ask ourselves? cup of wrath that is given to all humanity to drink. And, and uh, uh, the cup, uh, so the, when Jesus asked this question, it's a question of the all humanity that is being asked at that time. And from the, and from the silence from the heaven is that there is no other way. The wages of sin is death. A little sin or a big sin, it doesn't matter. For the fact of sin, Jesus needed to, Jesus needed to drink of the bitter cup so that we may have our salvation. And this because Jesus, Father told Jesus that you, you are the only one. There's no other way. No one can substitute you. There's no way of, of dodging this because you must go through this. Because you must go drink of this bitter cup. Because there is no other way. That's why we can have a, I can have a better understanding why in the mind of God, in the heart of God, that Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life to the Father. What your father is saying that you are the only one who can bring salvation to the humanity. And that's why he is the only way, the truth, and, and, and life. In our family worship, uh, I have a, one of my daughters ever inquisitive and, and quick to ask questions. And we were having family worship and we were talking about, I was sharing this um, insight with them. And the daughter asked me, Dad, Daddy, why didn't God give more than one way? Well, I knew the answer for that from Ravi Zacharias. And I like his answer. And Ravi Zacharias answered quite, this is very same question. And, and I did not teach my daughter to ask that question. She just came up with this question spontaneously, and I was ready for the answer. And the answer that Ravi Zacharias gives for this type of question is that if God gave a second way, Mankind, man, mankind would have wanted a third way. And he goes on to say that in the religion of Hindu, there are over one million gods, and that was not enough. And so they had one million and one god. And so uh, this one, the fact that Jesus was told by the silence of heaven that there is no other way and you needed to drink uh, of the cup, it tells me why Jesus is the only way to the Father. The third, third point that I like to uh, bring out is that what does this relation say of, about uh, God's relationship with you and me? Salvation is only through the merits of uh, Jesus' sacrifice. When Jesus asks if there's any other way, no matter how much that we have in the church, no matter how diligent we have done, no matter how much we donate to the, the good cause, to the gospel, no matter times, how many times we baptize, and no matter how many times we give Bible study, our action in it ourselves cannot add to getting a salvation from, the, from, from God. And the a silence from the heaven is a, a testament that our salvation is only through the sacrifice of, of son Jesus Christ. I remember sharing something like this, and an elder 
was very upset at me and came to me after the message and uh, wanted to discuss this. And he really felt like that we had a role to play in the salvation. And I, we're talking about two different things, and we, I took him to the book of James, and we can talk about that, but this is not the uh, time to talk about the uh, 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 book of James. But the salvation, the raw aspect of the salvation, it is 100% that is given to us through Jesus Christ. And I think this is important because academically, we Christians know that salvation is free to us. It is a f- salvation given to us through Jesus Christ. But that is academic Christian knowledge, but in depth of our heart, we always feel like there is something that we need to do to earn our salvation. Ironically and unconsciously, in many ways, I wonder if we Christians have more of the mindset of the Islam or Hindu and New Ager. You know, in the Islam, there is really no assurance of salvation. You just hope that you, out, at the end of your life, your good deeds outweigh the bad deeds. And sometimes I wonder if we Christians have that kind of a mindset. If I live a good life long enough, maybe something good will happen. And sometimes I wonder if we have the mindset of uh, New Age or Hindu. And maybe if something misfortune happens in my life, maybe it's because of something I did wrong because of this a punishment from God. And you know, also this tells us the silence from heaven. It is a clear answer to the modern relativism. Silence from heaven is that there is no, uh, no uh, uh, relativism, relativism in in, in, in the God's law, in the absolute moral law that God has given us. John 18, 11, it reads, after Jesus got up from the Garden of Gethsemane, and when Jesus asked the Father, Father, is there any other way? When the silence from heaven was, there is no other way. And three times Jesus said, not as I will, but as you will. You, Jesus repeated that you will be done. Nevertheless, if it is your will, Father, I will drink of the cup. And afterwards, John 18, 11, then said Jesus unto Peter, put up thy, your sword into the sheet. The cup which my Father hath given me, shall I not drink it? So here we see that Jesus is determined to drink the cup that God has, pre- the, wrath, the cup that God has prepared for him. We are given all the cup of the wrath of God. And Jesus came to this world to drink this cup of wrath. And while you and I are holding this cup in our hand, shaking in fear and of its consequences, from what we are reading here today, it is Jesus who came and took this cup of wrath that we are to drink, and he drank it in his place, and he replaced it with a cup of communion and fellowship with us. And we will not have to drink this cup until we gather in heaven. Jesus has a different cup for you and I to drink from. Psalms 116, 13, it reads, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Corinthians 1, 10, 16, it reads, The cup of the blessing which we, we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we, we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Jesus is not the only cup that he is presenting to us. The devil has a cup he offers to all as well. Jeremiah 51, 7, it reads, Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. Revelation 14, 8, and another angel follows saying, Babylon, fallen, fallen is Babylon, the great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. From the dialogue in the Gethsemane, we see why Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life, and only way to the Father. You know, oftentimes when I talk to a non-Christian or a New Age or a Hindu believer, many of them don't have any problem with the gospel. The moment you bring a point out that Jesus has to be the only way to the Father, this is one most people have a serious problem with. If to come to the Father, we can only come through Jesus. 
But to come to Jesus, there are many ways that we can come to Jesus through pastors, teachers, friends, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, through Bible teaching, through sermons, through many ways we can come to Jesus. But we can only come to the Father through uh, Jesus. You know, let's say you hold a cup. I didn't bring a cup today. I, I, I forgot to bring a cup with, filled with water. You know, if you hold a cup, if you hold a cup in front of you like this, and I had to do that in my younger days for, uh, you know, martial art exercises. We would hold a cup in our hands, and we would squat and, and sit there, and, and we'll see how long we can go. And sometimes we go for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, like that. Like we hold a cup of, let's say you hold a cup of water in your hand. After about maybe 10 minutes, you get soreness and fatigue and aching in your arms. And if you hold that cup for a long time, for hours, and what we have a back pain, you have a shoulder pain, and you have a cramping, eventually, if your whole body will work, you will be no longer be able to sustain that water cup. But the interesting thing is, throughout the whole time, the weight of the cup and the weight of the cup, water in the cup, has not changed. And I wonder how many times and how many people in this world, even maybe within our own community, how many are stubbornly hanging on to the cup when we can easily give, the, uh, give our cup that we have to drink to, to Jesus. And God, Jesus, has a different cup for us to drink that will refresh our soul and that will give us eternal life. You know, this was a very meaningful uh, enlightenment to me uh, as I'm trying to articulate it. It's not coming out as I really intended but to me, it was a, a profoundly, it affected my life profoundly and gave a greater insight into the salvation, the relevance of Jesus, why he has to be Jesus, why Jesus is the only way, the truth, and life, and why the worldview, the pluralistic view, why that cannot work. I have complained, why, why? Could there have been other way? But Jesus is the only way. There's no other way. When God asked, when Jesus asked the Father, is there any other way? Is there any other way? He asked the question of all generations. Father, can I contribute? Can I get some credit for the things that I've done for you in, in my Christian life? And the answer, the silence from heaven is no other way. And Ravi Zacharias, I remember his saying that when God saved for the salvation of humanity, God did not save, God did not, uh, um, God saved humanity through suffering and not around that. Here, it's silence from heaven is telling Jesus, no, you must go through. You must go. There is no other way. It tells me greater a degree of God's character, his holiness. Because God is holy. Because God is holy, he cannot compromise with him. God has the absolute power. But because God loved us so much that he gave his only son, begotten son, to come and die so that you and I ultimately will not have to drink this cup of wrath that we are all about to uh, have drink. Time will come. Time will come. And you know, time will come. And those who have accepted the living cup of communion from Jesus to eternal life. And there will be those who will refuse the cup that God has provided. And they will ask perhaps in their heart of hearts, in the fire brimstone and lake of fire, and call and scream, cry out to God, God, is there any other way? Is there any other way? And I can imagine the symbolic and silence from heaven is there was other way. There was other way. It is too late. You chose not to drink of the cup of my son. There was another way. And the silence from the heaven for them and the judgment day will be, there is no other way. So when James and John, mother, asked that their, their, her two, bro, two sons may sit right and left, Jesus asked them, are you able to drink of the cup that I'm about to drink? Are you able to be baptized and the baptism that I was baptized in. And Jesus answered later, and he says, Indeed, you will. You will. You know, interestingly, James and John, they said that they would be willing to drink of the cup. But at Gethsemane, when Judas and the soldiers came to capture Jesus, and when they saw the cup that they were really have to, when they literally in front of them saw the cup that they had to drink, how quickly they fled from Jesus. 
and Jesus was left alone to drink the bitter cup that God had prepared for him. You know, when John came to the, when um, John's mother, James and John's mother came, the disciples were very, you know, jealous, and they were very angry with them. And to me, something is so trivial, but it is kind of neat to me. In the desire of ages, you know, we all know John as the most beloved disciple of Jesus. But when John describes Peter, his end of his life, he wrote there, Peter, the beloved disciple of Jesus. And so there I see that John has finally understood what it means to uh, drink of the cup that Jesus has for them. All professed followers of Christ will have to drink of this cup. You and I will have to drink this cup daily. And to me, as I was meditating upon this, this cup that God has given us, and when I thought about it, is this the cup that I am willing to drink every day, every morning? The concept of it was the same as in, as in John 3.16. This is the same as the commandment to take up your cross daily and follow me. Matthew 16, Jesus, uh, 24, it says, Jesus told his disciples, if anyone, of, if anyone would come after me, will you go after Jesus every day? Let him deny himself. Are we denying ourselves and take up his cross and follow him? This is to me what it means to t- drink of the cup that Jesus is, is offering to us. For whoever will save his life will lose it, but whoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return uh, for his soul? So I, like, I guess I want to end with this. Are you able to drink of the cup that James and John were willing to drink? Are you not able to drink the cup that Jesus is, has drank? Are we able to be baptized with a baptism that Jesus was baptized with? If we drink the cup Jesus offered to us, he states we will sit with him on his right, at the right hand of the Father. Revelation 3.21, Jesus promises that if we do indeed drink of the cup that he offers to us, and if we are baptized in the baptism that he had, that as the mother of the sons of Zebedee requested all believers who partake of this will be able to sit at the right hand of the Father sharing the throne with uh, our our Savior Jesus Christ. Let us bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, the scene, what happened in Gethsemane is very vivid in my heart, in my mind. As I reread and revisit Father, I once again uh, grasp the importance of the plan of salvation and what you have done for uh, me. And Father, as I have uh, done my best to share, I pray that your Holy Spirit carry the message into their heart. If it be possible, Lord, that they will revisit your word on their own, that they may have their own inspiration and a deeper understanding of this great gift that you have given to us. And what a costly what you have given, what you have sacrificed, that I may have life. Father, thank you for the uh, gift that you have given to us, your son, Jesus Christ. Father, you are truly sovereign, Lord. There is none like you. Father, you hold the absolute rule of the heaven and earth and the universe. Your name shall be praised and proclaimed throughout eternity. Lord, I thank you for the written gospel and the message you have given to us. I pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Our closing hymn today is hymn number 159, The Old Rugged Cross.
like he wants to kill you. Yeah, it, but I've heard it hurts like really. For the last two months, we have been uh, busy um, planting seeds. Uh, we started our small garden, we have planted a lot of seeds there. And also, uh, Luna's parents and aunts were here. Uh, we have been planting a lot of seeds uh, in their hearts. Uh, they have left last week, uh, but we pray that God will uh, shower His blessings upon them, that the, those seeds will sprout and bear lots of fruits. Uh, like uh, 25. Uh, we were so busy and didn't have chance to say uh, bye to our seniors. But I like to take this chance to say, you know, congratulations. And God will, uh, we pray that God will lead you wherever you are. I'm bored. I'm going to church. <laughs> you too. Bye. bye. Okay, our raisins are still going up and down. This is a really neat experiment to try out. The train! I'm gonna say something, okay? Sabbath, then... Okay. And the catcher, if you catch something, toss it back toward the tosser. Here we go, let's play. Right. Coming your way. All right, coming your way. Oh. Oh. Happy Sabbath. I want to share with you guys a Sabbath afternoon activity that I can... Happy Sabbath. I want to share with you a happy... One more, coming your way. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for the patience those trials bring in the process of growing. I can learn to care. <laughs>
Let's see which cradle roll friends did their memory verses. God, I will praise you forever. Psalm 30, 12. God, I will praise you forever. Psalm 30, 12. Bye. God, I will praise you forever. Psalm? Psalm 30, 12. God, I'll praise you forever. Psalm 30, 12. <laughs> God, I will praise you forever. Psalm 30, 12. <laughs> All things work together for good to those who love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. And we truly sought to live with purpose even more diligently during our time in quarantine. We worked hard as a family and were able to finish building the chicken coop and stain the herb garden. More fruit trees were planted and many more seeds for our garden. The boys have started several business ventures for selling eggs and produce, and Joshua is working on starting his first art lesson online. The online platform has truly been a blessing to our family. Fred was able to start a great controversy study, and I was able to start a Daniel and Revelation study for kids. The quarantine has truly opened up opportunities for ministry by taking food to needy families and partnering with It Is Written's Hope Awakens Outreach to our community. Amidst all the busyness, we were able to spend precious time with family and had a memorable time celebrating Fred's 40th birthday. This time with family and with God has been the sweetest and will not soon be forgotten. May we not forget the lessons that we have learned during this time. God bless. Okay, let's take a look at the programs. What's the program say? Welcome. Welcome. Program, happy Sabbath. Sabbath is Korean. <laughs> Enjoy today's program. <laughs> Make the most of this time and spend it with the Lord. And number two, if you need to find something to do and you're getting tired of Netflix and recipes and sermons <laughs> and FaceTiming your friends and you want something new, find an instrument in your house <laughs> and learn how to play that instrument. Uh, because this is what I've been doing the past few days.